I want to get started in our first session this morning, and um, I'm really, really grateful, as I said, to be able to share with you all. Um, Tony and I have been married, as I said, 33 years. We have two beautiful daughters. I want to show you a picture of my family before we get started here, and uh, that way you get to kind of get a visual of our family here. And it's coming up. There we go. That's my family, my daughters, Alexis and Jordan. And... Um, and there's no way I would stand up here and talk about marriage if, honest God, truth, if my marriage was is in any way, um, it, it was unhealthy, it was, it was in a bad, bad place. I couldn't do what I do without her. I actually, my wife, Tanya, uh, is my best friend. I call her, her, I have a nickname for her. It's in my phone. Her name is Dr. Wife. She's a very smart person. She has two masters and like four or five degrees. She's just an amazing woman. And... Um, and I couldn't do what I do without her. As a matter of fact, a couple years ago, I created, uh, I was trying to find a way to honor her uh, for her birthday. So I did, a, I did something for her, and she was totally surprised. I want to show you, it's a, it's a movie poster I put together uh, for her. It's called My Bride, My Queen. And, um, and she is exactly, that's how I consider her. She's my bride, um, and she is my queen. And I always brag about it. She's my morning sunrise, my evening sunset the peanut in my Snickers bar, the sugar in my Kool-Aid. <laughs> She's all those things, and I couldn't do what I do without her. And as a matter of fact, that's what we're going to talk about in this first session. It's titled, I Do, Now What Do I Do? Or, if you're single, it's another way to look at this. Uh, and that is, what do I do before I say I do? And, you know, the lessons and the principles that we're sharing here today it could be captured in a way, even though you may not be married or wanting to be married, maybe there's some things you can understand what you should do. I remember when Tanya and I uh, said I do. Um, beautiful bride, it was th 33 years ago, and actually I have a few of the wedding pictures from our wedding uh, years ago. And uh, guys, go ahead and put, put those pictures up there if you don't mind. Um, those, those are... Uh, uh, that was me and my, my um, that should be, that, look at us, that, look at us. <laughs> look, look like coming to America, don't they? <laughs> we, were, we were young, we actually just talked about this last night with Pastor uh, Richard and uh, Nancy, is that I, I think I was 20, uh, two, uh, 22 years old. Uh, when we got married, she turned 21 on our honeymoon. And, you know, uh, we said I do. And then we went off to this uh, beautiful place called um, Cozumel. And we went to Cozumel, you know, we, we, we did that. And we came back to Houston to do our do. Which, honestly, we didn't really know what to do. But to be married like everyone said you should do. And, uh, you know, and I'm going to be very transparent today. We, we didn't have the answers. We didn't know exactly what to do. We didn't know how to do it. But um, we, we, we figured it out over the years, and, thank, and thanks to God. But let me give you a definition of the word do. The word do simply means the actions are commitment one does to bring something to pass. It's the actions, our commitment that one does to bring the actions to pass. So we, we started to think about what are the actions? You know, what do we do? Because in reality, in life, in real life, you can go out right now buy a car, you can go buy a microwave, you can go buy furniture, you can go out and buy uh, almost anything you go out and buy. You buy an iron, you buy um, a bike, they're going to come with instructions. Now, most women will read them, most men will not. Most men are like, I got this, I know how to do this. But in reality, they, you know, we know how to put things together or follow those instructions. But in marriage... There's really not a lot of instructions. There's no instruction manual to go and find outside of the Bible, which is the most important instruction manual you can have. And I think it's important for us to know that what is it that I do? Because in this world, in this culture, they prepare us for weddings. Now, if you want to know how to put on a wedding, there are magazines, there are websites, there are apps, there are all types of things. Uh, I went out to the store and found just all these magazines, and it's just amazing to me. And I mean, they're spending millions and millions of dollars on magazines on how to actually get married. But no one prepares you for marriage. And they go out and they come back and like, what do I do? 
Here's, what a, here's the difference between a wedding. A wedding is simply this. A wedding is a planned ceremony where two people publicly celebrate their love for one another. That's what a wedding is. But after that wedding, what is it that I do? And they, they prepare you. They prepare you what to do even after you go to your honeymoon. Here's what U.S. bride and wedding uh, planner said, that the top eight things you do after you go on honeymoon. Send announcements and pictures to the media, letting them know you got married. Choose your prints for the photo album. Write and mail and thank you notes to everyone who, uh, who supported you. Have wedding gown clean and preserved. Why, I don't know. Return any borrowed items. Obtain new license and social security card in your new name. Update the financial and banking records. This is what they prepare you to do. But uh, my, my sister uh, is a professional wedding planner in Texas, and she does these glamorous weddings. And I asked her, uh, uh, Deborah, tell me, what are some of the most um, things you see or the biggest mistakes you see couples making before they say, I do? And she says, as a wedding planner, I see couples spend money they don't have putting on a production for family and friends instead of investing in their future lives together. I think people are more in love with the wedding than they are with the marriage itself. This is so true in our culture today, and it's never been more clear than now. After the pandemic and throughout the pandemic, honestly, there's a lot of things we could talk about in terms of the pandemic, what we believe is true, what we believe is not true, how, what the government did, what the government didn't do, all those things. But here's the reality. One thing I know for sure as a pastor, that the pandemic exposed marriages. It exposed what we've been doing. It exposed fakeness, how people have just been going through and doing the things that they've been doing every day. And now all of a sudden, we got to live together. All of a sudden, now we got to stay in the house together, and we got to be around each other 24 hours. We learned a lot about ourselves, didn't we? And unfortunately, some didn't make it. They didn't make it out of the pandemic. Maybe they made it through and never got COVID, never affected them, but in terms of their marriages, it's unfortunate. Because here's the deal, if we follow the pattern of the world and not the pattern of the word, we will always fail. See, the world will always, uh, when you follow the patterns of the world, what they do, it's going to bring about disappointment, it's going to bring about dysfunction, it's going to bring about drought in your life. But if you follow God's way, he will meet your desires. I promise you, if you follow the way of God, it, it, there will be a spirit of discernment that comes upon you. There will be a depthness to your marriage. And from Genesis to Revelation, this is, I believe, the instruction manual, the Word of God. From Genesis to Revelation, it's a playbook about relationships. It's, a, it's not a book about religion. It's not a book about rules. It's a book about relationships. And if we just follow what God's Word says, we will begin to see the fruit in our marriages, in our relationships, whether it's somebody I'm married to or someone I want to be married to. A relationship is defined as this. It's two or more people who are connected and associated and linked with one another in a common bond. In a common bond. God wants us to have success in our relationships. And I'm going to challenge you this morning. I'm going to challenge you to do something today. Every husband, every wife, every person here is in a relationship. I'm going to encourage you to do something. I'm going to encourage you to take your relationships and take your marriage off of autopilot. It's so easy to put things on autopilot right now. And we just kind of go through the motion. Let me give you a definition of autopilot, just so in case you don't know. It's functioning without a conscious thought. It's going through the motions out of habit. Can I ask you a question? How many of you are married out of habit? You just marry. You come home, hey dear, hey honey, how's the kids? How's work? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, how many of us are doing that? And so we, I, I truly believe that God wants us to take our, our, our marriages and our relationship off of autopilot and drive ourselves. How do I know if my marriage is on autopilot? Thank you for asking. Here's a sign your marriage may be on autopilot. Commitment is all but gone. Your commitment is all but gone. You're just whatever. Um, communication in your marriage is on pause. You know, my wife and I um, have two beautiful daughters, and, uh, and they both moved out of the house, and, and they moved out of the house, and we've been, you know, kind of 
you know, being parents for all these years. And here's, here's one of the things I knew that it was time for us to really change because our communication really wasn't, it wasn't good. We thought it was. We, were, we weren't mad at each other. There was no issues. But we, we started not knowing how to talk. And, you know, they say empty nest. And nobody prepared us for this one. There's a lot of things people didn't prepare us for. They prepared us for a lot of things, but they didn't prepare us for the empty nest. Nobody walk around saying, be, be, be prepared, the empty nest. And also, they didn't tell me when the nest is empty that they fly back too. <laughs> Wish somebody would have told me that. I'd have clipped the wings. <laughs> they fly back. But I, I you know, I just remember, I, I, you know, one, Tanya actually is the one that brought it up, you know, because she was coming home from work and from school. I'm coming home from work and ministry and walking in the house and just kind of, you know, come in and, and I go in my room and I, she go to her room. I go watch TV. She go do what she's doing. And we're just like, hey, we're not talking. We're not communicating. We're just kind of going through this. And, you know, we were still, we still to, the, to this day, let's just show you how we had to start changing. We still use words now that we were using when our girls were toddlers. We, we still use the word potty. Like, I'm going to go potty. Like, why are we still saying potty? <laughs> so if communication is on pause in your marriage, then it may be on autopilot. Here's another sign that your marriage may be on autopilot. Change is rejected. Change is rejected. Anytime there's an opportunity for you to make some changes. Like now, the Holy Spirit is speaking and ministering, and he's already starting to stir up things. And I can see how some people want to shut down, and they want to kind of go on their phone and kind of look away. Or, or I can just do any, if I can be anywhere else, right, um, anywhere else right now except here. See, we've got to be willing to change. Everyone. I don't care how long you've been married. I don't care how successful, how amazing things are. We all have to be willing to make some changes. Here's the, here's the last thing I'll say about autopilot. Um, if concern for your spouse is not your concern anymore, you are on autopilot. If you're not concerned that your spouse is concerned about something, then you are on autopilot. Jimmy Evans, one of the most, I believe, powerful speakers of time for, this mar for marriage ministry, said, the instant you hit autopilot in your marriage, it is in danger. And Romans chapter 12, verse 9 says this, and it's so powerful. It says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord. Um, rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Let me read that one slower. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God bless them. I love verse 15. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who, are, who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Amen. Don't think you know it all. Don't think you have arrived. Don't think that you have succeeded and I don't need to do anything else. And this is, I can prove that every one of you in here don't think that way. Because if you did, you would not be here on a Saturday morning, as precious as this time is. You're here, you don't think you know it all. You know it's time to invest in your life and invest in your marriage. I believe this, that relationships, marriage, doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be hard. It does, it's not, uh, as the world say, impossible. And why is this so important that we protect this, this thing called marriage? Because the world is in the devil and the culture is trying to wipe it out. But here's what I believe. I believe the world cannot cancel the church and cannot cancel the message of Christ and cannot cancel what God has created. 
It's so important that we follow what God's word says and not what the world says. I think one of the things in, when it comes to marriage, and my, I do, is we're going to talk a little more about this later on in a couple of our sessions. We're going to do some practical things that's going to really help you to see this, that we have to understand what our expectations are. If you're here married and you're here wanting to be married, what are your expectations about marriage? If I were to go and ask you about your marriage before you got married, there was all kinds of expectations that we have. And that's the challenge, that expectations. Here's what an expectation is. It's a strong belief that something will happen or be the case. I want to challenge you to put a different expectation on your marriage. I want to challenge you to expect your husband to be the best husband. I want to challenge you to expect your wife to be the best wife. I want to encourage you to expect yourself to be the best you can be for your spouse. Expect the best. Everybody say, expect the best. <laughs> Psalms 34 verse 7 says this, The Lord hears his people when they call to help, for help, um, call to him for help. He rescues them from all their trouble. You see, our expectations have to be clear. And what you know, need to know about expectations is so important. Uh, expectations are often uncommunicated. They're often uncommunicated. So most people put this expectation on their spouse that they never knew that's what I wanted you, that's what I wanted you to do. You know, um, they're unfair often in marriage, in relationships. We go into this idea, uh, we're inconsiderate, unreasonable. Not anybody here, but the other marriage conferences we speak at, there's a lot of unfair expectations on marriage. They're unclear. They leave doubt and confusion. What do you want me to do? Huh? What? My wife, this is the one thing I know about my wife. She is never unclear about her expectations of me. She lets me know right away. She doesn't walk around the house calling me pastor. Matter of fact, if she calls me pastor at home, I'm in trouble. Because she's like, pastor? It's trash night. And you forgot to do this, or you forgot to do that. She'll let me know. But I think it's so important for us to be, um, you know, clear and, and make sure we let our spouses know what's going on. I remember the first time my wife, um, you know, I just, I just had this expectation that she was going to cook just like my mom. True. I just, I didn't, I never voiced that to her. I never said it to her. But I remember the first time it really hit me that, I haven't been clear. <laughs> so she said one night, I'm coming home from work. She says, so what are we having tonight? She said, we're having spaghetti. I was like, yes. All right, all right, then, spaghetti. Because when mom made spaghetti, it was, it was like, it was the bomb, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm kind of sitting around and I'm watching her, and I just noticed the, her approach to spaghetti <laughs> was not the same way that we did spaghetti at home and you know in the hood you know I was in, in the hood in the ghetto where I'm from all the spaghetti everything was made in one pot <laughs> can I get an amen can I get an amen here because you know it just tastes better and so I'm looking over there and she got this she got the noodles separate sauce separate and like all this extra what's, what's all of this and she's like here's your spaghetti uh, I didn't expect this Um, expectations are unknown. They're secret. You got these expectations. And how in the world are you going to be upset with your spouse when they don't know the secrets that's in your heart? You mad, you didn't read my mind. Basically is what you should say. You should have read my mind. How can I read your mind? How do I know that's what you wanted? And you were upset with me, and you were walking around not talking to me for three days because I didn't know what your expectations were. Amen. Un, listen to this, ungodly expectations squeezes out trust, squeezes out intimacy, squeezes out unconditional love. You can't have unrealistic, ungodly expectations placed on your spouse. If not, if you do, it's going to squeeze out trust. They're walking around afraid. They're walking around concern? Am I meeting her needs? Am I meeting his needs? Ex ex explain what your expectations are. Now, be realistic about your expectations as well. 
You know, there's, you know, you can't be like, I want to have sex every night. That's an unrealistic, ungodly expectation. <laughs> On top of it, you will die if you have sex every night. <laughs> but talk about it. Have a conversation about it. We're going to get to some of that today. Listen, here's what's important. If you're taking notes, write this one down because this is some God put in our hearts and, and, and we, just, we just stay on this, is that if you want your marriage to work, then you have to work on your marriage. If you want your marriage to work, then you have to work on your marriage. If you want your relationships to work, you have to work on your relationships. Here's another way to look at it. If your relationships are not working, that's because you're not working on your relationships. If your marriage is not working, it's possible that you're not working on your marriage. What is the definition of marriage? Because it's being redefined in our world, but I'm going to stick with the one I know where it started at, and that's God. Yeah. Marriage is a, des a design institution created and ordained by God where two imperfect people choose to covenant with one another for life as husband and wife. I'm going to say it again. Marriage is a design institution. Marriage is not an accident. Marriage is not just something you, you know, just do. It's a divine, a design um, institution created and ordained by God where two imperfect people choose to covenant with one another for life. For life. For, everybody say for life. It has to be for life. You know, there are more animals that mate, that animals that mate for life. Seahorses, they mate for life. Wolves, certain um, packs of wolves, they mate for life. Certain eagles mate for life. Like, we're in this for life. There are some animals that have more commitment to their relationship than human beings. There's some, this, this doesn't mean anything to people anymore outside of the church and those of us who are deciding we're going to live our life according to God's word. Some people are more committed to their phone contract. You know you got at least two years before you can change. And you'll hold on to that raggedy phone for two years. And you'll be like, oh my gosh, I can't wait. For two years, for two years, but one little incident in their marriage, they're like, this is over, I'm out of here. I quit. Because she didn't make my spaghetti like I, my mama made it. <laughs> marriage is godly, holy, anointed, biblical, abundant, powerful, living, purposeful. This is what you ought to be speaking over your marriage. Not that it's not working and it's stupid and I hate you and you know, all this and that. It should be speaking. It's godly. It's holy. It's anointed. It's biblical. It's abundant. It's powerful. It's living. It's purposeful. Amen. And God gave us the script. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, and further, submit to one another. See, we often get twisted when we hear this word submit. I ain't submitting to nobody. I'm not his slave. God didn't say for him to just you to submit to him. He also says for him to submit to you. Listen, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husband as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body of the church. As the church submits to Christ, so wives, you should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives as Christ loved the church. He gave us, gave up his life for her. See, if we just follow the signs of God's word, we will get to our destination of a happily ever after marriage. We will get to it. You know, we follow signs of the world. There are signs. I'm going to show you a couple of uh, signs that we see every day on the highway. Uh, these are signs that we see every day on the highway. And for the most part, we all know what they mean at some point. When stop, a railroad, um, you know, caution, uh, are, you know, this is a dead end, all that. But so for some reason, when it comes to relationships, we ignore all the signs. And often, those of you especially that are thinking about being married right now, we miss the signs. 
The signs were there all the time. The Holy Spirit, that's what I love about it, that the Holy Spirit will show us signs. Look what the Bible says, and before I show you that, in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, it says, this is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroad and look around. Ask for godly ways, all godly ways, and walk in it. Travel its path, and you will find rest for your souls. But you reply, no, that's not the road we want. And some people are like, no, that's not what I want. The Holy Spirit shows us signs. Let me show you the first one of the first signs. If you see this sign, uh, m most people don't. Dead in relationship. Some people right now, the Holy Spirit is saying to you, this is a dead in relationship. Now, I'm not, this is not an out for you to go and say, you know what, I, I'm so glad. I thank you, Lord. I, I, you know, I've been looking for a sign to get out of this marriage. Nope, nope, that you're in it. You're in it to win it. But some people ignore the signs. What's the next one? Do not enter this relationship. There's somebody here right now. You're in a relationship. And maybe it's not marital or a serious relationship, but the Lord and the Holy Spirit has been telling you, don't enter. But there's some people like, well, I'm a, I, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to enter in it and look what happens. Don't enter. How about this one? Next one. Relationships. Rough ride ahead. This is going to be a rough ride. And understand that what you have to do in a rough ride. Yesterday we were flying in. The captain told us that we were getting ready to land at the airport. Says, listen, folks, we're going to actually shut down things early. Um, flight attendants, take your seats. We're going to land. And when we land, it's going to be a little rough. That's going to be some turbulence. And the runway is a little shorter than, than normal. So we're going to have a hard stop. Prepare yourself. So basically what that means, don't be up walking around when the plane is landing. You're about to run into some rough, some rough things. Some of you, you're, you've run into some rough roads. But listen, prepare yourself. Buckle up. That's why you're here today. How about the next one, guys? Slow down. Children ahead. This goes both ways. There's some people that are young in marriage, and, and I just want to encourage you. Just, you know, take your time to enjoy one another. Take your time to enjoy one another because kids are game changers. They change the game in every way possible. And it's like I said, you, you, you know, you, you, everything is focused on them. And you don't even know each other. And so when they're gone and out of the house, you're like, oh, hey, how are you? My name is Lee. Oh, oh what's your name? Tanya, yes. Oh, hey, Tanya, how you doing? You're the lady that's been with these kids all these years. We got to get to know one another. Also, if you're in a relationship and you're not married, slow down. So, but this feels so good. We love, we love having sex. This is, what's so wrong with it? God made sex for marriage. It's good. They say it feels good. It's supposed to. Amen. <laughs> say amen, somebody. Amen. Proverbs chapter 4. Let me wrap this up. Proverbs chapter 4 says, verse 13. Take hold of my instructions. Don't let them go. Guard them, for they are keys to life. Do it, don't do as the wicked do. What does the wicked do? The wicked says, you know what? I'm divorcing you. I'm out of here. Don't follow the path of evildoers. Don't even think about it. Don't go that way. Turn away from it and keep moving. What I need you to know is when you say I do, You did not commit to be in competition with your spouse. What you committed to was to be in covenant with your spouse. And one of the reasons why so many marriages are struggling is because they're competing with each other when you should be in covenant with each other. I want to give you an example of a competing marriage. Go ahead and put it on the screen, guys, if you would. A competing, a, com, com, a com, competitive marriage is, there's always clashing. It's how you know you're in a competitive marriage. There's opposition. Um, you're struggling. There's, it's a battle. You're, you know, you see your spouse as the adversary or the enemy. They're not for me. I feel like, a, you know, there's this constant conflict. There's just a constant fight and a, like a tug of war. And 
and, and it's, that, they, you know, they're the opposite of you. That's not what God, when you said I do, you did not say I do to a competition. I'm not in a competition against my wife. I'm in covenant with my wife. I'm in covenant with her. Not in a competition. I'm not trying to one-up her. I'm not trying to make her, you know, be behind me. She's not my rival. She, she, I couldn't do what I do without her. Now, does that mean that we don't have challenges? Does that mean that we don't have conflict? And does it mean that we don't have war at times? We're, we're opposite? No, no this, that actually happens. But if this is all that you're into this for, your wife does something good, you're like, well, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to do it better. You know, no, listen, we've got to be in covenant. Let me show you what a covenant marriage looks like. A covenant marriage, there's... All those other things do happen. But in a covenant marriage, there's a pledge that you made. So that means that I don't care. Divorce is not an option. They're dedicated. There's love. That we're in bond. There's a trust in how we do this. There's a devotion. There's a commitment. There's a promise I made to you that I'm going to stick to no matter how much you frustrate me and get on my nerves. I'm in covenant with you. There is no out. We are like seahorses, an eagle, and, and, and a wolf. We're in this together. The seahorse is so committed to its relationship, it has the babies. The male seahorse has the babies. That's commitment. <laughs> We've got to be willing to stay committed to this. And here's what I want to say to you, that my commitment to my, to my marriage, this covenant that I'm in, my covenant is not in the ring that we wear. It's not in the size of house that we have. That doesn't mean that my marriage is in covenant because we got a nice house and we got nice jobs and I got a nice ring. My ring is not my marriage. I'm so thankful for that because I have lost my ring three times. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Matter of fact, the first time I lost my ring was right here um, in, in California. I actually lost it. I was speaking at a conference at, um, um, at Disneyland Hotel, and I'm on the plane, and I'm headed home, and I feel like I forgot something, like I feel like I forgot something. And all of a sudden, it clicked to me. I looked down, and I, my ring was not on my finger. And I remember I left it at the hotel. And I'm scared to go home and tell her. <laughs> I've lost it three times. Yeah, three times. And I'm so glad she understands that our relationship, you know, now, me losing my ring and her losing her ring is probably a little different. She will not lose it, I know it, but I lost my ring three times, so I'm down to now. Actually, this, this is actually a rubber band. Got a whole bag of them. Amen. Deuteronomy, verse 23 says that when you make a vow to the Lord, your God, be prompt in fulfilling whatever you promised him. For the Lord, your God, demands that you, prompt, that you promptly fulfill all your vows or you'll be guilty of sin. I'm praying that God will renew in you your vows today. Because your vows in marriage is not 50-50. Marriage is not 50-50. It is 100-100. You have a 100% commitment as a spouse, as a wife, as a husband to one another. It's so important to understand this, that when you win, we win. When my wife wins, we win. A covenant is an unbreakable bond. And as long as there's close connection with each other and with God, that covenant will stand. It will stand. Um, I have, I honestly, I have so much more to share, but I just want you to understand something. This is an investment. Marriage is an investment. You've got to work on your marriage. If you want your marriage to work, you've got to work on your marriage. Anybody ever heard the Rolls Royce car? It's a car that a lot of people have heard of. You know what it takes to make a Rolls Royce? It takes over six months to build a Rolls Royce. One car. Someone's listening to the engine for eight hours. 
to find any imperfections in it. The carpet in a Rolls Royce is tested and rubbed together back and forth over 100,000 times to make sure it has durability. It takes that much time, 17 days, for the, um, for the seats of a Rolls Royce to be created because they're, they're meticulous about it. 800 man hours goes into making a Rolls Royce. You know what it takes to make a Toyota? 20 hours. <laughs> and unfortunately, many people are treating their marriage like a Toyota, and your marriage is a Rolls Royce. Amen. And God wants you to spend that kind of time into it, and that I do into it, and stop treating your spouse like a Toyota. Nothing wrong with a Toyota. It's okay, but I just want you to understand that you are sleeping next to a Rolls Royce every night. And you got to be delicate with that Rolls Royce. You don't take it out in any kind of weather. You treat it and you rub it down and make sure it's all clean. <laughs> and you ride in that Rolls Royce. Slow, smooth. You don't rush it. Amen. <laughs> in this session, I always ask at the end of it for people to take a really deep, look inside of their lives, no matter where you are in your marriage, good or bad, and ask yourself these three questions. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Every single person should ask themselves about their marriage, about any relationship you're in, and it's simply this. The first one is this. What's working in this relationship? You see, here's the deal. A lot of people are looking for all of these things, a bunch of stuff to work. I want you to identify one thing that's working in your relationship right now. One. What's one thing that's working? Don't look at everything that's not working. Look at one thing. Here's the second question. Every person needs to ask themselves, what's not working in this relationship? What's not working? Be honest. Because if you're not honest, it's going to continue to not work. And if you're not focusing on what's not working, it's going to start not working. It's going to cause other things to not work. And it's going to tear down the entire Rolls Royce. And then here's the last one. What's the win? Like, every time we do this, we win in this relationship. It's a win. Praise God. My wife, I, you know, the other, other day, I'm, I'm in the kitchen, and I was washing dishes, and she said to me, oh my gosh, that is so sexy. I'm like, that's a win. Man, I got that pot, I'm like, I'm, I'm washing dishes. Dishwashing, no, man, you're not, you're not taking my win. How's this, baby? Well, how's this right here? Mm -hmm. How's this cup right here? How'd that do it for you? She told me that I was vacuuming one day. I was like, really? Vacuum? Man, I wanted to get two vacuums. I was just like, she said, that's so sexy. What's the win? What's the win? Last thing, I promise you this. So much to say. When you say I do, here's what you're saying I do to. You're saying I do to change. I'm saying I do to being willing to change. I'm saying I do to have conversations with you and to clarify my expectations. When I say I do, I'm saying I care. I'm going to display kindness and concern for you. That's what I'm saying. When I say I do, I'm saying I'm willing to compromise. I'm going to compromise some things. I'm going to do some things different. I'm going to put down some things that I did not have, uh, wasn't willing to put down before I got married, but now I'm, I said I do. I'm going to compromise some things in our marriage, like um, video games. If video games, if you find yourself arguing as a husband and wife, I want you to listen to me, fellas, especially. If you are debating and arguing over you spend too much time on the video games and not enough time looking at me, man, that is a problem. Dude, let it go. It's not worth it. I get that you like your shooting and playing Madden and all of that, but man, you're married now. And I know I'm making that one-sided talking to the men, but I'm just saying you, you have to compromise. 
then if you, when you said I do, you said I do to cutting ties. Permanently removing certain things in your life. If you have girlfriends in your life that are not married and they're always talking single this and single that, and girl, look at him and look at that, and, and you're married, and there are certain things, I'll put it this way, if there are toxic relationships in your life, you've got to cut ties with them. Amen. When you said I do, you said I do to contentment, being grateful and happy with what and who you are now. And we're going to thank God for that. Amen. I want to pray. Sweetheart, would you come up with me? We're going to pray, close out. So much to be said, um, but um, I just want to make sure we do justice here. I want you to stand on your feet, everyone, and we're going to pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father God, for the I do's, not the I don'ts anymore. We come against the spirit of I don't want this anymore, and we pray and lean into the heart of I do. Father, we first said I do to you. It's a vow to you and a vow to one another. And so we commit to each other now as husband and wives, Lord God, to lean into the Holy Spirit, to the voice of the Lord as he's spoken to us today. For some, it's challenging. For others, it's conviction. For others, Lord God, it's a moment of change. It's a crossroad to make the changes that they need to make. I pray, Lord God, there'll be no shame, no guilt, no condemnation being put on anyone but a freedom and a peace to walk in love, a freedom and a peace to live in the covenant of marriage. And Lord God, I pray for these marriages to be blessed over and above. Let them be honest with you and honest with one another as they grow together today. Autopilot is off, and we're driving down this path of marriage according to the Lord. The navigational system of the Holy Spirit is leading us in the right direction. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God.